met as well this morning as we continue along in the Passion Week. Um, we are still actually on Tuesday. Today's portion of Scripture in Mark chapter 13 is actually on Tuesday. It's a day of conflict. And so obviously um, next week is Mother's Day. So uh, gentlemen, if you, if you forgot how to, uh, or if you forgot that it was Mother's Day, make sure that you go out and you take care of some of that stuff as well. And uh, my wife, you know, is easy in that aspect. She just wants, she wants plants and she wants flowers. And I just say, let's go to Lowe's and you have fun. And then she goes in there and gets the flowers and the plants and everything else. But please do not forget Mother's Day next week. Invite your mom to church. I'm, I'm sure that actually uh, mom would love to come to church. Your, your grandma and all, everything else would, would love to come out. Your spiritual mom as well. And so make sure that as we, uh, as we go through that, obviously next week we'll take a break from Mark uh, chapter, uh, uh, the Gospel of Mark. And it will be towards uh, Mother's Day in that. But like I said, today's you know in the most important week, the Passion Week. We are on Tuesday, which is the day of conflict. And Mark chapter 13, it parallels, it coincides with Matthew chapter 24 and, and Luke 21. So if you're ever wondering you know, how they you know, fit up in the other Gospels, that's where, they are, you know, that's where it's at and that's where it's in there. So like I said, Mark chapter 13, starting at verse 1, and you're ready to go. And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, See what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be. But the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains, and let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein to take anything out of his house. And let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. But woe to them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. And pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, for in those days shall be affliction, such as was not from the beginning of the creation, which God created unto this time, neither shall be. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. And then, if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or Lo, he is there, believe him not. For false Christ and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. But take ye heed. Behold, I have foretold you all things. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then 
shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Now, learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is near. So ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that this morning you would fill me with your spirit. Lord, God, I ask that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear that your word, the seed of your word would find, uh, find uh, fertile soil upon our hearts. And Lord, that we would understand what you are telling us in this moment. And Lord, I ask that you would also, Lord, uh, fill me, Lord, with your spirit. And Lord, that you would be as a fire shut up in my bones, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week we talked about, you know, in Mark chapter 12, we talked about the, par uh, the parable of the vineyard, and also uh, not to be blinded by people that use flattering words, because people will try to blind you by using flattering words to get what they want. Also, we need to give to God what is His, right? Also, we see what marriage in the kingdom of God is. You will know who your spouse is in heaven. But will it matter? No, it won't. Because of the fact is, you're in heaven. It is an awesome thing to be in there. And then also being close to getting saved is not saved. A person that is close to getting saved is not saved. A person must be saved in order to, you know, as the Bible says, saved to the uttermost in order to be saved. We also saw the Catholic uh, hypocrisy and also the widow's farthing, talking about the fact that, you know what, that it doesn't necessarily matter the dollar amount or anything that you give. What it matters is, is where your heart is at. And that God loves a cheerful giver. God asks us to give the tithe. And he says, you know what, when you do that, you know, I'm going to open up the, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the floodgates of heaven. And he's going to pour out a blessing upon you. He also says that when you don't, he says, you're going to be cursed with a curse. And so that's what we saw last week in Mark chapter 12. This week in Mark chapter 13, as you could tell from the way that you know, uh, it was read, we're going to be talking about the end times. And so this morning in Mark chapter uh, 13, we're going to look at verses four, oh, sorry, one through four, the first four verses, and what it's going to talk about is the destruction of the temple. It's going to talk about the destruction of the temple. And it says this in verse one, and as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here? And Jesus answering uh, said unto him, seest thou uh, these great buildings? There shall, not be one, uh, there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall, be uh, that shall not be thrown down. And, at, and as he uh, sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? And so what we need to realize is the one that's probably asking this question is probably Peter. Peter's the one that usually always speaks up. You know, when the other ones are quiet and don't really want to, you know, really ask Jesus a question, Peter has no problem with opening up his mouth. He's usually the mouthpiece that is, is used out of the 12. And so he begins to ask him, says, Lord, look at how beautiful this temple is. Look at how, look at how great this is. But then Jesus begins to speak to him prophetically about the end times of, of what's going to happen uh, in the end times and about the temple. He says, there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. This was a prophecy that was fulfilled in 70 A.D. 
with the destruction of the second temple by Emperor Titus. And this is not, you know, Titus, the one that, you know, whom Paul wrote the letter to. This isn't an emperor they wrote to. And you know what? Not one stone was left upon another. They've actually gone back to the ruins where it is. And just as Jesus said, because where, where the Jewish people come, you know, to the Wailing Wall and they, and they bob back and forth, that is not the original Temple Mount. They call it the Temple Mount. But the thing is, is that in order for that to be still up and be the Temple Mount, means that Jesus lied and, you know, when he said that this was the Temple Mount. You can actually go you know, about you know, a, a few miles, I believe it's to the east, and you will see an area where there was something built and not one stone was left upon another, fulfilling what, God, uh, what Jesus says here, that you know, what, he would destroy that temple. And that's where they believe that the original Temple Mount is. And there's vast reasons why. You know, the Bible talks about where it was actually located and where the Temple Mount is now. None of that exists. But where it was originally and where they went to, because there's supposed to be, you know, uh, the springs of Goshen and all these other things are right below that, right where they say that the Temple Mount originally was. And in that area, no, step, uh, no stone is left upon another. And so that area where they're bobbing and weaving and all that other kind of stuff, and the, and the Jews and the Muslims are fighting over that spot, it's not even the original spot. They're not even fighting over the, same spot, uh, the original spot. So in other words, what I say is, is that when the Antichrist comes to, uh, you know, to go into that temple, as we'll see here in a moment, goes into that temple and declares himself to be God, they don't have to fight over the Temple Mount. They have to go to, over to an area you know, right now where sheep are grazing because nothing is built there. All they have to do is go over there and build it because the Bible talks about the third temple will be built upon the, that temple mount, the original one, not the one that, you know, that they're fighting over. All right? And so there's oftentimes people will sit there and begin to say, I don't understand how they're going to get together. They, you know, you know, they always butt heads. They're always fighting. They're not going to have to fight over it because they're going to actually get to read their Bible you know, that they should have been reading and figure out, hey, you know what? This is actually the original Temple Mount, not that one. All right? And so we see this uh, all fulfilled in this, you know, in this you know, portion of Scripture. In the first four verses, Jesus talks about it. It happens about 35, 40 years later, all right? That all of a sudden that this temple, you know, that, that temple is destroyed by Emperor Titus. And so we go on to the, uh, the second portion, uh, you know, uh, point number two is the Gentile nations in the last day. The Gentile nations in the last day. So we saw the destruction of the temple. We're now going to see the Gentile nations in the last day. And things will escalate as we, uh, as we will see here. And for, uh, we're going to go on to uh, verses 5 through 13. The Bible reads, And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. This morning, I may go a little bit long, I'm just telling you right now, because I want you to understand what is going on in the, uh, in the end times, all right? I don't want you to be deceived. I don't want you to wonder what's going on or what's going to happen. I want you to see what the Bible says about the end times. And so what Jesus does, he gives a warning right away. He says, take heed, lest any man deceive you. He does not want you to be ignorant of this subject, he says, I don't want any way to deceive you. I want you to understand what I'm about to say and what I'm about to go through. All right? So Peter, and, uh, Peter James, and John obviously talked to Jesus privately, asking him when all this is going to take place, what signs are going you know, uh, to be there. And Jesus, like it says, watch out so no one can deceive you. So this is where Jesus begins to speak with his disciples about the end times. And I don't believe that there's anyone in this room that would argue that Jesus is talking about the end times. The language that he uses is all about the end times. But people will say, well, no, this is only for the Jewish people. No, Jesus is talking to all. He's talking to everyone. All right? And I'll show you that, that he's saying this to everyone. So verse 6 says this, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. This is why he doesn't want you to be deceived, because there are going to be many that are going to come saying, I am Christ. And he says, don't be deceived by him. It's not me. And when uh, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled. For such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. 
For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places. And there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. But take heed to yourselves, for, uh, for they shall deliver you up to councils and in the synagogues. And ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must be first, excuse me, must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither, shall, uh, uh, neither do ye uh, premeditate, uh, but whatsoever shall be given unto you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death and the son or sorry and the father of the son and the children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death and he shall be hated of all men for my name's sake but he shall he that shall endure until the end the same shall be saved so what we see in here there's a lot of natural disasters that are going to be taking place right it talks about there's, there's wars and rumors of wars there's going to be earthquakes there's going to be famines there's going to be troubles nations are going to rise against nation right and it says you know what all of this is the beginning of sorrows all of this honestly you can say you know what that's what's been happening all through time you say well we've had earthquakes right we should know that from the the, the new major fault line you know, Mississippi River running backwards for three days? Usually ri rivers don't run backwards. Just in case you, you know, were unsure about that. Rivers don't run backwards. So we've seen all these things, wars, rumors of wars, and all. The, we see that now. We, there's a rumor of war, of World War III, right? All these things. And you go, okay, I, I don't understand. So what are you trying to say, Pastor? I'm saying all this stuff you've seen. I do believe that it's going to escalate even further. You say, well, how can it further escalate? It's going to. It's going to further escalate, you know, to where, you know, maybe this one that we look at and we're going, you know, the whole Ukraine war, Russia war, war with China. Oh, I, sorry, we're not actually at war with China or Russia or any of those other ones, right? We're just helping out a country, but yet we sent troops over there, right? Yeah. If you believe that, then, you know, I got some, you know, ice I'd like to sell you on a hot day. But Jesus gives, you know, while he's given this wonderful news of wars and rumors of wars, he, gives, he always gives comfort, does he not? He says that there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, says, but don't be troubled. He says, you know what, Ra uh, nations are going to rise against nations and uh, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be er earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrow, he says, but take heed to yourselves, for they shall, not, uh, they shall deliver you up. And at this point, he begins to tell them what? When they're going to come up and put you before trial, he's going to give you the words to speak. When all these things are going to happen, you know what? He's going to help you out. The Holy Ghost is going to be with you while this is all happening. All right? And he says, in, you know, here's the other thing. That at this point, he says, brother is going to betray brother. Father is going to betray son. Kids are going to rise up against their parents. You go, well, that's already happening now. But all, in all these things, he begins to put this, he says, and you're going to be hated of all men. For my name's sake, you go, well, how, is this, you know, how is this a good thing? He says, you know what? But he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. That is our hope, right? Is the fact that we're going to go all through all this stuff and we're going to be saved. And you say, well, pastor, we're not going to go through this. I hate to tell you. You're going to go through this. There's ones out there that you know, believe in the you know, pre-tribulation rapture. Pre-tribulation rapture means that, there's gonna, that you're going to go up in heaven before all this happens. Have we read anywhere so far that says you're going to be gone? Don't worry about this. No, he's, he's talking to you like, hey, you're going to go through this. You're going to have troubles. You're going to have all this happen. He says, but I'm going to be there with you. He says all these things you know, to him, and he comforts them as he's going through it because he's like, all this junk, all this stuff is going to happen to you. He says, but don't worry about it because you're saved. He never says, I'm going to take you out of this. He always you know, says, you know what, you're going to go through it. 
He always gives these things as well. And so later on, you're gonna, you know, I'm going to show you that Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins were wrong. The Left Behind movies are wrong. That we're not going to have you know, people, you know, we're not going to be sitting on an airplane and all of a sudden clothes are going to just be there. And we're wondering, is that person running around without their clothes on? The Bible doesn't speak of the way that it does in the Left Behind movies. I'll just tell you that right now. And I'll show you this. So just keep your mind open to it because the thing is, the Bible doesn't say that anywhere. But as I said, you know, he gives, he gives re, uh, reasons for certain things, but he always brings words of comfort. Like I said, it says, you know, the, you know, the people will be deceived. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. But don't be troubled by it. For such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. He's telling you, you know what? Oh, you're going to go through all this stuff, but that's not the end. It says nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and, and so forth. And, he says, and this is the beginning of sorrows. It says, you're going to be brought before rulers, and this is going to be a testimony against them. He says, when they bring you and they question you and all these other things, and the Holy Ghost is with you answering, he says, this is going to be used as a testimony against them. In other words, when they get to heaven, they're not going to have an excuse for what they did. You say, well, how are they going to get to heaven? They'll be there for a short period of time. And then judgment will happen, and they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. All right? And so what we need to you know, look at is that, is that even when you're brought before authorities, don't worry about what to say. And it says, and the gospel must first be published unto all nations. In other words, proclaimed. It doesn't mean like writing down and everything else. It means proclaimed. It means the fact that you're going to go out and you're going to tell somebody. It says, when everybody knows. And you know how I know this? That this is, you know, that people go, well, you know what, when that happens. Well, the thing is, the Bible doesn't even say, you know, the Bible says that this proclamation can happen through nature. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. He says, you know what, even nature proclaims it. So at that point, you know what? We could sit there and say, you know what? Christ could come at any time. Not every ear has to hear it. The thing is that, you know, the Bible you know, right here says that uh, creation shows them who God is so that they are without excuse. So why, why is it, you know, I mean, this is the reason why it's so important that we go knock door to door, that we go out soul winning is because of this. Because I, personally, this is one of my things. I want to be able to say, in Romans chapter 15, verse 19, it says, By the power of the Spirit of God, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. I want to be, be able to be, you know, that be said of me. Is that I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. I haven't held anything back. My life's verse is this. is in Acts chapter 3, verse, uh, uh, 3, verse 6. It says, Silver and gold have I none. You know that I have no silver or gold. Sorry, I, I got a gold wedding ring. I'm sorry, I, you know, I got that. But, uh, but such as I have, I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It says, rise up and walk. I want to you come up to someone and say, you know, I don't have money to give you. I can't give you anything. But I, what I do have, I can give you, which is Jesus Christ. I, want, you know, I don't want them to, you know, to look to me you know, for financial gain. What I want them to look to me and say, you know what? He knows Jesus, and I want to know that Jesus that he knows. Amen? Let's look at verse uh, 13 of Mark chapter 13. And in a moment here, I'm actually going to go uh, uh, back and forth between Matthew 24 and Luke chapter 21. Why? Because they parallel. They're, they're, he's telling the same story, all right? Verse 13, And he shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. Now, reading this one, there's a common misinterpretation. They'll sit there and they really say, see right here, it says, he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. Saying that you have to, you know, that you can lose your salvation, that if you don't hold on to your salvation, that this is what's going to happen, you're not going to be saved. Does it say that? No. What he is speaking of is a physical salvation. He's talking about saving this life, this body. It does not teach that we can lose our salvation during the end times because what it says, it says, you know, because of the fact it says, but he that shall endure until the, uh, until the end, the same shall be saved. 
This is speaking of physical salvation, of being saved physically, not spiritually. This is not salvation. How do I know that? Look at the previous verse. Verse 12. It says, Now the brother shall betray the brother to death. Do you think that he's killing him spiritually or killing him physically? It's physically, right? It says, and the, the father, the son, and the, the children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. He is not talking about spiritual death. He is talking about physical death. He's talking about at this point, you know, later on he'll say, you know what, that it's going to be hard for people to actually, you know, to stay alive during the end times, during the tribulation, during the great tribulation. Luke, 20, uh, Luke 21, verse 24, the Bible says this, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled. How are you going to die? How are they going to kill you? By the edge of the sword. They're going to behead you. And you know, for those that you know, sit there and say, I don't want to lose my head. I don't want to have my head cut off. You probably feel maybe at the most, maybe like five seconds of pain. You know why? You can't live that long without your head. And I'm giving five seconds, you know, that's actually being generous. You're probably not going to, you know, probably it'll be about maybe a second or two, and then all of a sudden you're going to be in eternity. You're going to be gone. If that's the way that, you know, it happens, you know, I'm sorry. I was like, okay, go ahead. Just go ahead. Just, I just want to make sure. I'm gonna, the only thing I might ask is, okay, make sure that thing is sharp. Because I want, if, he's gonna do, if that person's going to do it, I'm going to say, you know, just take it right off. Right, you know, I want a clean one. All right? But when we look at this, you know, as well as, as we can see the fact that we can't, you know, as far as salvation-wise, we can't lose it, right? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39 says this, But we are not of them which draw back under perdition. Why? You can't. Perdition means that you cannot be saved. That's why Judas is called the son of perdition. Because he couldn't be saved. He was, he was a reprobate. But it goes on to say, it says, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. It says, if you believe, you believe your soul is saved, right? When things, while these things will escalate, then is really, uh, there is really nothing to give us a sign to say, hey, you know what? The end is really around the corner. Except, my next point the nation of Israel in the last days. This is the abomination of desolation. This is the sign that you will see, that you will know that Christ is right around the corner. This is something that you can see, that you can hear, that you're going to know about. You know why? Because as I'm going to you know, show here in a moment, there's going to be something that you're going to go, oh yeah, that makes sense. I can see that. I can hear that. And I'm going to know that this is going to take place. Verse 14. But when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not. He's understanding. He's saying, you know what? There's going to be somebody standing in this place, and they should not be there. It says, let him that readeth understand. Then let uh, them that be in Judah, uh, sorry, Judea flee to the mountains. What we need to realize and understand is that he's speaking of a sacrifice or he's speaking of someone that's going to get in there, that's going to say something or do something that is against what he says, against his sacrifice. Why? Because Jesus is the perfect sacrifice, right? So if you would like to, you can flip over to Jan uh, Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8, the Bible reads in verse 13, it says, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto, the, uh, unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? He's saying, you know what? He had received a vision, right, of the daily sacrifice. Back then it was animal sacrifices, but Christ had already fulfilled, has already fulfilled all sacrifices. He is the perfect sacrifice. That is why we don't need the temple sacrifices anymore. Because Christ fulfilled all of those when he died upon the cross, you know, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? He fulfilled all those things. The Bible says that he did not come to abolish the law, but to what? Fulfill the law. 
So it talks about it and it says the transgression of desolation. This is the abomination of desolation. It says to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. When something is trodden underfoot, that means, you know what, somebody's stomping it underfoot. He's saying, you know what, they're basically, uh, you know, it's the fact that they're taking the sacrifice and basically dancing all over it or stomping all over it. Who is the sacrifice? Jesus Christ. So they're going to make a proclamation or they're going to do something in the, in the temple that is going to go against Jesus Christ. Okay? Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the, uh, and the obliteration uh, uh, to cease for, uh, for the overspreading of, the, uh, of abominations. He shall make it desolate even unto the consummation that determine. Uh, that determined shall be poured out unto, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me, upon the desolate. When the Bible speaks of the end times, it, it usually uses in terms of weeks, right? When we look at the Bible and it talks about the end time, it talks about weeks, it's, it's say Daniel's 70th week. It'll talk about it's going to happen in the midst of the week, in which this one does. It says in the midst of the week. And that, you know, the abomination of desolation is going to happen in the midst of the week. Okay? That's what he's, he's referring to. A few more chapters over in Daniel. Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. And it says, And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. Why would the daily sacrifice be taken away if you're supposed to be making daily sacrifices? Because Jesus had fulfilled those, right? It says, and, and here it says, so we have that time period, and then it says this one right here. It says, and the abomination that maketh desolation set up. There shall be 1,290 days. So he's saying between the span of it being taken away, which Jesus Christ obviously you know, took it away right on the cross. He says, we don't need any more sacrifices. He says, there's going to be 1,290 days, and then the abomination that makes desolation is going to be set up. You say, well, how many days is that? The Bible is speaking figuratively here as far as the uh, 1,290 days. And so we know, we just know that once that's taken away and there's going to be abomination that's going to be set up, that's going to be the sign that you're going to be able to see, right? So what is the abomination of desolation? There's a lot of people that have this idea, you know, of, that they're going to get in there and going to you know, sacrifice a pig, that they're going to do all this. Let me tell you this. Emperor Nero already did that. In the second temple, before it was destroyed, went into that temple and, uh, and sacrificed a pig upon the altar, which is considered to be like the worst of the worst. But it's not the worst of what's going to take place. That temple was destroyed as Jesus predicted. The abomination of desolation is a phrase from the book of Daniel uh, describing the pagan sacrifices with which the second century B.C. Greek uh, king Antiochus, uh, and they talk about this Antiochus uh, Epiphanes, uh, replaced, and he was one of the ones as well, replaced the, uh, the daily sacrifice, the twice daily sacrifice in the temple, or alternatively, the altar on which such sacrifices were made. I got that off of Wikipedia because they, they talked about that as well. So in other words, Antiochus um, offered false, detestable sacrifices to spit in the face of God because they, he knew that the Jewish people would take offense to it, and he knew that God would because God said never to do that. All right? So what, the, what sacrifice would be the most abominable and most heinous to God? It wouldn't be the fact of a sacrificing a pig upon the altar. Wouldn't it be when somebody comes into that temple and declares them to be God in that temple? Because that person is saying that they don't need God, that they are God, and they're trying to replace God. Antichrist means that there's another Christ. It's not a Christ. It's another Christ that's coming in. So when the Antichrist comes and declares himself to be God in the third temple, this is the abomination of desolation, and we will see it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I want you to see it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. It 
2 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting at verse 1, I'm going to go through uh, verse 4. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. That first verse, what does it tell you is happening? It says, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's talking about the second coming of Christ. It says, by our gathering together. This is like the rapture, right? It says we're going to be gathered together. Doesn't the Bible talk about the rapture, us being caught up together? That, that, ye be, uh, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as, that, uh, as the day of Christ is at hand. He's telling us again, I don't want you to be deceived. I don't want you to be shaken in mind. I don't want it to frazzle you. I don't want it to take you by surprise, right? He says he, says he doesn't want you to be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as, as from us, he says, even if, you, even if you get a letter from us, he says, don't believe it. He says, as the day of Christ is at hand, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who is the Antichrist, by the way, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped. What did Satan say he wanted to do? He said that he wanted to be higher than God. He wanted to exalt himself higher than God. This is Satan. He want, You know what? He looks at God and spits at him and says, you know what? I'm going to be better than you. Here's the ironic thing about it. Do you know that Satan was created by God? That is the created saying to the creator that I'm going to be better than you. Have you ever had a toy that, say, you know, that will tell you I am better than you? Or you've created something, all of a sudden you're out there working on your house, and your house talks back to you and says, I am better than you are. If you have a house like that, I want you to move. But that's what he is saying. The created Satan who was created by God, who all of a sudden, you know what, was cast down from, from heaven. Why? Because he wanted to be higher than God. He wanted to take the place of God. He's going to say, you know what? His, his, the Bible says this, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He's going to sit there and say, you know what? I am God. And that is the abomination of desolation. Why? Because we have a perfect sacrifice that had already done away with all the, uh, all the sacrifices. And the one that has already shown himself to be God. And so what's going to happen, the Bible says that Satan, who is the Antichrist, is going to do what? He's basically going to possess someone to be the Antichrist. And what he's going to do is have all kinds of signs and lying wonders. That's why I say, you know what, it's very scary for the Pentecostal church. It is very scary for the Pentecostal church. What do you know, Pentecostals talk about all the time? Well, you know, this happened over here. So and so got saved. So you know, did you see this happen? And the Bible says that Satan's going to be able to do these things, all lying wonders and signs. I've heard pastors go, "Well, how do we know it's a lie?" That's not the point. You're supposed. To, he's been telling you, "Don't be deceived. It's not me." He's going to give you a very visible sign that you know that it's him. For one thing, you're going to see the Antichrist stand up, right, and say that he is God, right? When that happens, the Bible says, don't be deceived by it. Don't believe it. He's lying to you. He's the father of lies, right? Now, is this an event that you can see and hear and know? Yes. You can see. I can guarantee it. It'll be on CNN. It'll be on Fox News. It'll be on all these, you know, Newsmax and OAN and all these. Other. They'll be showing this. And they'll say it's a wonderful thing. Do you know why? Because he, said, he will say that he's going to bring peace upon the earth. But it's only going to be short-lived. It says, standing where it ought not. That is, as explained you know, in Matthew 24, 15, it says, standing in the holy place. He's standing in that temple declaring that he is God. The next, you know, the next you know, portion that you want to call this or the next event or the next uh, you know, thing on the timeline is Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble is talked about in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. And it says this, Alas, for that day is great 
so that none is like it. It is even uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. What is he you know, he's telling you here? He says, you know what? It's going to be an event like no other that's going to happen. There's going to be a time where you're going to see all this stuff happening. It's going to be persecution like you've never seen before. Persecution happens over in the Middle East, right? You're going to see it in Canada. You're going to see it in Australia. You're going to see it all over the earth. Persecution happening. And if you think that that's not going to happen, I brought this up before, you know, a few weeks ago, is the fact that if they can make a murderer the victim and have you forget the victims, what am I referring to? I'm referring to the transvestite that went into that school and shot you know, three nine-year-olds and, and three adults. They flipped that story and said, you know what? The victim is the murderer, the transvestite. They said, you know what? It's because of Christians that it drove her, it, to do this. Whatever pronoun she wants to use. And by the way, majority of the time in the Bible, when somebody you know, refers to themselves in, in, in different pronouns, like they, them, we, all that, they're demon-possessed. A little side note for you. Let's go back to Mark chapter 13. Let's look at verses 15 through 23. It says, And let them that is on the housetop not go down into the house, Neither uh, enter therein to take anything out of the house, uh, anything out of his house, and let uh, him that is in, that is in uh, the field, not go back or not turn back again, for it uh, to take up his garment. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, and pray, pray that uh, your flight be not in winter, for in those days. Shall, shall be affliction. Now notice how he uses affliction. He's going to use flic- affliction and uh, tri- tribulation and all those things together. He uses them synonymously throughout this portion. Let's continue. It says, Such as was not from the beginning of creation, which God created until this time, neither shall be. He is telling you that there's going to be an affliction, there's going to be a persecution, there's going to be a tribulation that the world has never seen before. Why does he talk about the fact of, you know, woe unto them that are with child? Think about it. If you're being persecuted and you're running for your life, how fast does a pregnant mother run? Most of the times I've seen your pregnant you know, mothers, you know, they, they, don't, they don't run. And it says, and well, it says, it says, and to them that give suck in those days, even a newborn mother, she's not going to run with her child. And it says, pray ye that your flight be not in winter. Why? It's cold in winter. What happens in winter when you get cold? You can freeze to death. That's he's giving these warnings. Let's continue. It says, and except uh, that the Lord has uh, shortened those days, no flesh shall be saved, but for the elect's sake, elect's sake, uh, safe sake, elect's sake, whom he hath uh, chosen. He has shortened the, uh, the days, and then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is the Christ, or lo, uh, he is there, believe him not. For false Christ and false prophets shall arise, and show, uh, shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect, but take Ye heed, uh, behold, I have foretold you all things. He is going on and he is telling you at this time period what also happens when he, after he declares himself to be God, the Antichrist, is that the mark of the beast is going to be, uh, take place. This is why the persecution will happen because they're going to know that you're a Christian. Why? Because you're not going to take the mark of the beast. A person that is saved will not take it. And for those that don't take it, what's going to end up happening? They're going to know that you you don't believe, and they're going to say, they're Christians, go get them. They're going to know. But here's the thing is, what does he tell you? He's going to shorten those days. 
But here's the other part. It says, shall sow signs and wonders to seduce, even if it were possible, the elect. These signs and wonders are going to be so amazing and so awesome. I shouldn't say awesome, but, you know, so deceiving. Because God, God does awesome wonders. So deceiving that it says, you know what? If it were possible, the saved believers might actually believe them. It says, but they're not going to. Verse 20 says, and except that the Lord had, had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's, uh, for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he has shortened the days. Again, this is not spiritual salvation. This is you staying alive physically. He says no flesh. He doesn't talk about the spirit. He talks about the flesh. He talks about your body. He says, you know what? If you, uh, he says, he, he says, uh, that no flesh, no body, your body is not going to, you know, if you stay you know, for the elect's sake, this is not a physical salvation. This is talking about you staying alive physically. And what he's going to do in that part, in the part where it says, if it were possible, even the elect, it's going to be so convincing that the world will follow whatever he says. The world's going to follow him no matter what he says. Because they're going to see all these signs and wonders and all these things that you say, and he's, he's going to bring about peace. The scary thing for the Jewish people, those that believe in the Jewish religion, is this is exactly who they're looking for, is the Antichrist. They believe he's going to be a political figure, that he's going to come up and he's going to bring peace, he's going to do all these you know, signs and wonders. They're looking for the Antichrist. All these, they've been looking for a political figure since Jesus' time. That's the reason why a lot of, you know, the the religious leaders and people missed it, because they were told it's going to be a political leader that's going to overthrow, you know, Rome and the government at that time. And the Jewish people still believe this, the people in the Jewish religion still believe this to this day. And so when the Antichrist comes, that's our Messiah. It's a false Messiah that they're going to believe on. This is why we need to go share the gospel with the Jewish people, with the Muslim, with the Hindu, with the heathen, with all those, anyone around that does not know Jesus Christ, that you could be saved by faith alone. This is why we share the gospel with them. Verse 23 says, but take heed, behold, I have told you all things. Jesus told you everything. He says, this is what's going to happen. And this coincides with Mark, um, sorry, uh, Matthew chapter 24 and Luke chapter 21. He tells the same things. He gives different details about certain things. That way you can get the full picture of what everything is going on. But for the sake of time, I did not go through everything in those areas. Everything Jesus has spoken of until now is during the great tribulation and the rapture has not taken place yet. How do I know this? How do I know that this is the great tribulation spoken of in uh, Revelation chapter 7? Well, Revelation chapter 7, verse 14 says, And I said unto them, Sir, thou knowest, and I said unto them, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have uh, have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. He also says, you know what? Later on, he says, All these saints have been killed during the tribulation... Right? And these are the ones, that, you know, basically that have just got here. So these are the ones that had just come out of the Great Tribulation. So it's not the fact that, the, you know, at that point, obviously they're raptured out because they're in heaven. But he's saying, you know, these are the ones that did what? That just came out of. These are all the martyrs of during that time period that had just got here. What I want you to realize, and the biggest part, of this, we'll see how far I can get. My next point is, the Bible says, after that tribulation. This is the second coming of Christ. Mark 13, verse 24 through 27 says, but in those days, after that tribulation. So he's been talking about all this stuff. He's saying everything's going on. He goes, he goes and now... After that tribulation, after the great tribulation, it says, The sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, 
and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then, and then, here's the thing. Everybody's going to see that. You're telling me you cannot see the sun all of a sudden darken, and the moon's not going to give her light, and all of a sudden the stars are going to fall from heaven, and you're not going to be able to see that? And then he says, and then shall they see the Son of Man. Who's the Son of Man? Jesus Christ shall, uh, coming in the clouds with great power and glory. This is the second coming of Christ. This is the rapture that ends up taking place. And it says, and then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect. Who are the elect? Christians, believers are. It says, from the four winds, from the uttermost parts of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. This is the rapture. And we say, well, you know what? No, we're going to be gone long before. No, he's saying, and then. He says, you're going to see these things happen. And then what happens? Jesus comes in the clouds, and then he takes up those saints, and then God's wrath is poured out. That's the reason why it says in Revelation that there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Because he's going to give those that have heard the gospel before and have rejected it to sit there and go, you know what? I just saw Jesus Christ come in the clouds. I saw everybody raptured up into heaven. And they're going to sit there. And the Bible talks about, you know, that there are going to, you know, God's wrath is going to be poured out. That people are going to cry and scream and be in anguish in that half an hour. And all of a sudden, you know, sorry, that half an hour that they're going to be, you know, sitting there and they're going to be wondering what's going on. That they've missed their moment, and God's going to pour, then after that half hour, God's going to pour out his wrath upon the earth. Like never before. You think that Noah's flood was, was horrible? You think that, you know, that Sodom and Gomorrah was horrible? You think all the times where God poured out? No, this is going to be something that, you've ne- that, that we will never see. Why? Because we're going to be up in heaven with him. This is the part we won't see. We're not going to see God's wrath. God has not appointed us to wrath. But you know what? Because other times people will say, you know what? God has not appointed us to wrath when they were referring to the great tribulation, saying the tribulation and wrath are the same thing. They are not. God says that we will go through tribulation, that we will go through trials, that we will go through persecution, but we will never see God's wrath. Never. They are different. They are not the same. So how do I know that this is speaking of the end times? Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 through 30 says this, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall the Son of Man uh, in heaven, and there shall all tribes of the earth mourn. Sounds like something's happening, right? And it says, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with, uh, with power and great glory, and he shall uh, send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So how do I know this is a rapture? And then... And then, and it says all are going to see. This is why a secret rapture is not, you know, is not biblical. Do you know why it says what? It says, right there it says, and then shall, uh, shall they see the Son of Man coming with great power and glory. It says that all will see him. All will see him. It says, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see. This is why Left Behind, Jerry Jenkins, making all those movies and everything else is false. Because a secret rapture can't happen if everyone sees it. A secret rapture is like how they're describing in the movie where all of a sudden people are gone, and you're wondering, what happened to Grandpa? Well, his clothes are over here. What happened? All of a sudden, somebody's driving. Nobody's driving now, but there's clothes left. That makes for great movies and great cinema and everything else, but it is false. It does not happen. The Bible shows that everyone is going to see the Lord coming in the clouds. 
and they're going to realize their mistake. Or the other ones that are saved are going to look at it and say, you know what? Amen, he's here. All this that I've gone through, everything in my life that I've gone through, I'm going to be with him forever and ever, amen? How do I know that this is the rapture? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. Because everything up to this point, this is a, uh, this is a clear-cut uh, rapture passage, is it not? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 always talks, everybody goes to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 when they're talking about the rapture and the second coming of Christ. It says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Do we have that in these verses? Shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God. Do we not have that in these verses? Yes, we do. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So, ever we, uh, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Does that not talk about Mark chapter 13 and Matthew chapter 24? Read Luke chapter 21 and you'll see it there as well. These, all these events are associated with the rapture of the second coming of Christ. Christians will not go through God's wrath, as I said before. God, you will not go through God's wrath being poured out, but you will go through the great tribulation. Tribulation and God's wrath, again, are not equal. They're not the same thing. Believers are subject to trials, tribulations, persecution, etc. But non-believers will have God's wrath poured out upon them. Non-believers. So if you have people in your family that are not saved, I, be, I begin to, you know, to talk to them about the Lord. And at this point, have I mentioned any time frame? Have I mentioned when this is going to happen? Have I said, at this time, the rapture of the church is going to happen? I didn't give you 88 reasons why the Lord was coming back in 1988, did I? Or 89 reasons why the Lord is coming back in 1989. Obviously, those books are, you know, should be laughed at right now. They should be. They should have been laughed at back then in 1988 and 1989. The next portion that's going to happen is the rapture of the church and the sign you know, that we've been talking about. He, he begins with a, a parable in verse 28. He says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree, which uh, her branch is yet tender and put forth leaves, yet know that summer is near. So, uh, so ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the door. He is saying, you know what? When you see all these things happen, when you see that, you know, when you see, you know, the abomination of desolation, when you see all these things, it says, you know what, your, your redemption is nigh. That's what it says in Luke chapter 21, verse 28, it says, And when these things be, uh, begin to come to pass, and then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. When all these things happen, he says, you know what, you're going to know. You're going to see it. He says, lift up your head, you're going to be sitting there, man, I'm being persecuted, I almost had my head chopped off. I almost had all these things. And he says, you know what? Lift your, up your head because your redemption draws nigh. He is coming in the clouds for his church. Amen? He is coming in the clouds for his church. The fig tree is symbolic of Israel. Israel will be planted in its land and will bear leaves but not fruit. That is what this is saying about the parable of the fig tree. You notice it says that, you know what? You're going to put forth uh, leaves but you're not going to bring forth fruit. This is said of the Jewish nation. Jesus refers to the flood in, in Matthew as a sign of the rapture. He talks about the fact that the most of the Jewish people who think that they are saved because they are God's chosen people, yet they hate the Savior, are going to get to go to heaven, right? They talk about these things. But this is how it's going to be for those that are not saved. Matthew chapter 24 Verses 37 and 30, uh, through 39 says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving into marriage until the day that, that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And you say, well, see right there, we're not going to know the day or the hour. I haven't said a day or the hour that he is coming. You said, well, yeah, but you said that we're going to go through the tribulation and then, you know, that all of a sudden that we're going to be raptured out of the church and then all of a sudden Jesus is going to come back. Have I given you a date? All this is saying on here, you know, uh, in here in Matthew chapter 24 is that, you know what, 
Everybody else is going to sit there and be like, hey, you know what? I'm going to go out, and I'm going to eat, and I'm going to drink, I'm going to marry, I'm going to give in to marriage. We're going to go, all, uh, life is going to be normal. And then I'm going to come upon you. And you're not going to have a second chance. Because oftentimes people, you know, that believe in the pre-trip rapture, you know, the one that says that we're not going to have to go through the rapture, that believe all this stuff, I pray, I pray that the pre-trip rapture is, is correct, but I don't see it, you know, at all in Scripture. I don't see it. You know why? Because I see the stuff happening now, and I'm going, please let it be true. But it's not. It's like I'm asking the Lord to do something that's not true. Because people will look at the pre-tribulation rapture, they'll say, you know what, all the saints get to go up, and then there's a second chance. Because remember, and if you ever watched the Left Behind movies or read the books, you're the tribulation force. And they get a second chance to be saved. It's like, oh man, I should have accepted Jesus while I had the chance. Jesus, what does he say? He says, you know what, you're not going to get a second chance. Your second chance is life right now. Your second chance is following the Lord Jesus Christ, believing on him right now. That is your second chance. It's not going to be after all of a sudden grandpa like, disappears and you go, oh man, I wonder what happened to him. He must have been right. It's not going to be that moment. You're not going to have that moment. Here's the, the thing is, you know, that we could take this to the bank, is the, certain, the certainty of his word. We believe that the Bible is true, right? Thank you for saying yes, because, you know, if there was nobody on that one, I'd be like, okay, well, apparently it's falling upon deaf ears. All right. Verse 30 of Mark uh, 30, uh, 13 says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. What generation does Jesus refer to? Well, it cannot be the generation of the disciples, obviously, because they did not see the, the triumphant return of Jesus. It is undoubtedly the generation that will see these signs and know that he is there, especially the abomination of desolation. These events and Jesus' return won't be on some thousand-year timetable, but it will happen in succession. It will happen according to those times. He's referring to the generations that's going to see all these things take place. Verse 31, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. This is how I know it's true, because God is truth. He speaks truth, and he says right here, he says, heaven and earth shall not pass, or shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Jesus didn't say that he, his ideas or his thoughts or that if I just give you the gist of what I mean shall, pa shall not pass away. We have ones out there that believe, you know what? Well, God's words, we'll translate those, you know, we'll translate his ideas or his thoughts. But we can't really know what his word says. Yes, he can. Or he just gives us the gist of it. No, he says his words shall not pass away. He wasn't making that up. He wasn't being figurative when he said that. He also didn't say that some archaeologists will come and dig up my words in some cave that will contradict each other. He also didn't say that the originals would be lost, but so you're going to have to go out and dig up some fragments and paste God's words back together, hoping that you get, you know, how it is to be saved. He never said that. Jesus preserved his word for all generations. If your Bible says that it has been relying on contradicting manuscripts and fragments or that they, that they can get, you know, that they can get God's word from the Vatican or save it from some, from some burn pile that was set to be cast into the fire because it was worthless, I'm sorry, my friend. But you know what? You, have, you don't have the true preserved word of God. Jesus promised to, uh, to preserve his word for what? All generations. He didn't say, you know what? Oh, well, the dark ages happened, so God's word didn't happen. No, his word was there. God's word has always been there. He says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not. So for those that want to read like the Message Bible, that think that that's God's word, that is a piece of junk that should be thrown in the trash. The Ebonics Bible should be thrown in the trash. A lot of these Bibles nowadays should be thrown in the trash. You know why? Because they give you a thought-for-thought thought translation. They don't want to give you the Word of God. They want to give you something. They go, well, you know what? We kind of got the gist. We kind of got you know, God's idea of what he wanted to say. And there's verses that contradict each other. If your Bible is a part of the Codex Vaticanus. You know what the Vaticanus is? Think about you know, the first part of the word Vaticanus. 
What does it sound like to you? And that's exactly where it comes from, the Vatican. It comes from the Catholic Church. There's a reason why there are translations out there that have a Catholic edition, because they didn't have to change anything. But they will also put them in a Christian bookstore and say, you know what, you can read it. But they don't put Catholic edition because, you know, they don't want to confuse you. It's the same one. It's the same one. You know, Codex Sinaiticus. These are all different, you know, uh, manuscripts and, you know, whatever. Do you know where they found that one? A man by the name of Tischendorf went to a monastery. Okay, who's in a monastery? Priest, monks, Catholic, right? Goes in there, sees a, a thing of manuscripts that are getting ready to be burned in the fire because they are worthless. He says, I want those. And the guy goes, you don't want these. These are, these are worthless. There's nothing to it. He goes, no, I'll pay you for them. And, he, and the guy says, okay. Do you know which book of the Bible or, you know, that... Tischendorf translated first the epistle of Barnabas. If you have Barnabas in your Bible, for one thing, that's wrong. But here's the thing is, why is he so, he's like, I cannot wait. I can, I'm just so excited for God. I'm so excited that I'm going to be able to translate this. I'm going to go translate the epistle of Barnabas. That's a heretical book. And yet, a lot of the translations nowadays are based off of those two manuscripts who argue with themselves. Do you want me to give you a for instance? The NIV, 1984. The Bible, you know, it says right there, it says, it says that Jesus had compassion upon the people. And, uh, NIV, 2011. Jesus was indignant with the people. Do you not think those two words are a little bit different? That Jesus had compassion on one set, but all of a sudden now he's like mad with them? They also, in Isaiah, and I'll do a sermon about this a little later maybe. In Isaiah, I've talked about this before. In Isaiah, they will, and in Revelation, these, some of these modern ones will do what? They will make it say that Jesus or sorry, that, yeah, that Jesus is Satan. They will make us say it. Because in one place, they, call, uh, you know, they say the bright of the morning star is Satan. And then in Revelation, it says it's Jesus. Which one is it? Who's the bright and morning star? So if your Bible doesn't, you know, you know talk on you know, those two different... I mean, to me, that's enough to get rid of that Bible. You say, well, pastor, it's just two. It's more than two. It's more than two. And it's not just, quote, unquote, doctrinal differences. It contradicts itself. And you know what? The last time I checked, God's, God said he's not the author of confusion, that he does not contradict anything that he says, and that everything that he says is yes and amen, that it is true that God is not a liar. Amen? That's a whole other sermon for a whole other time. I end with this. Because people will sit there and say this, well, Pastor... No man knoweth the day or the hour. I agree. I agree. I have not put any kind of date on it. I've never said anything about you know, how long it is or what time period. The Bible says that he's going to shorten those days. You know, all those things. But I've never, did I ever say that, you know, in 2028? Or have I ever, no. I just said, you know what? When you see the Antichrist go into that temple and declare that he is God, Jesus is around that corner. He's coming. He's coming quickly. A lot quicker than you ever think. Let's look at the last five verses here. Verse 32 through 37. It says, But of that day and that uh, hour knoweth no man, no, uh, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray. Again, he's warning you. It says, For ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye. How many times is he, is he saying this? He's saying watch, 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 watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye, uh, for, uh, ye know not 
when the master of the house cometh, or at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he, uh, he find you sleeping. And when I say unto you, I say unto all. Is he saying it to just the Jewish people? He says, I say it unto all. The last time I checked, all means everybody, right? And he says, I say unto all, watch. He says, watch. Why? Because you know what? All this, you know, we have all this confusion happening on around. He says, you know what? Watch for the things that I told you to watch out for. Don't, don't worry about CNN. Don't worry about MSNBC. Don't worry about Fox News. Don't worry about all those ones. If all of a sudden you flip it on and there's a guy in there that's all of a sudden declaring that he's God in a, in a, in a temple, yeah, watch that. But what he's saying is, all these things are going to take place, and what you need to do is watch. He's trying to tell you over and over again, I don't want you to be you know, scared. I don't want you to be taken by surprise. I, don't want you, I want you to know, you know what? Watch. Be comforted. What? Because your redemption draws nigh. When Jesus says the, that, that our knoweth no man, we are to watch and pray, and to every man, we are to continue to work until that day comes. How are we supposed to work? Share the gospel. Do what God has asked you to do. Learn what God's word says. Study God's word. Memorize it. Meditate upon it. And when I say the word meditate, I mean that you're thinking upon God's word and how he's been faithful to you. Again, I say, as Jesus says, as he ends chapter 13, watch. Watch for the signs that he gave us throughout Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke 21, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Watch. Because you know what? God wants you to know the day and the hour. He wants you to know it. He wants you to know when he's coming. When I say he wants you to know the day and the hour, he wants you to, to know that he's coming soon. I'm not putting a date on there. I'm saying the fact is, is that he wants you to know when he, that he's coming soon. And so if there is anyone this morning, if I could have every head bowed and every eye closed, if there is someone this morning, whether it be in person or online, that would say, you know what, I'm not sure where I'm going, but I want to know. I want to know where I'm going. I don't want to be caught off guard. I don't want to be, you know, wondering. But I want to know that if, if in, in my lifetime, if I see these things happen, that I'm ready. That I am ready to go. That no matter what happens to me, whether I'm beheaded, whether I die of old age, whether I you know, make it all the way to the rapture, that I'm going. And I say that if that is you, you say, you know what? I don't know that. I'm not sure where I'm going. I just ask that you would raise your hand and you would say, Pastor, would you come pray with me? So that way I can, you know, I can be saved and I can know beyond a shadow of a doubt. The Bible says that you can know 100% that you have eternal life. It is not something that you're being in a process for. It's not saying any of that. It is saying that you can know today you know, that you have eternal life. And so if that is you, you say, you know what, I want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm saved. I just ask that you would raise your hand. And if there's anyone online that wants to know, they, can, they are more than welcome to call or get a hold of us on, on uh, Facebook or on, uh, on YouTube, and we'll try to get a hold of them. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is so clear Lord, about your word. I believe, Lord, I thank you that it's so clear and concise that it shows us, Lord. It shows us what we're going to go through. It shows us um, the things that are going to take place. Lord, you, you said so many times that you did not want us to be taken by surprise, to give heed, to watch. So, Lord, I pray that every single person in this room that is a believer, that they would watch and that they would believe your word, that when they see these things happen, that they would know that, their redemption draws nigh. I thank you, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we are dismissed, I just want to let you know that uh, tonight at 5 o'clock, 
that you know we have a first youth and then also we have a prayer meeting and then wednesday night we will have our bible study and then also first kids remix as well and like i say if you are interested and you are not able to make it to the meeting about the creation museum ark encounter all that uh please see my wife because we have to close that uh really soon as far as those are going to be able to go with that well yeah you have to tell her today and so if you want to if you want to go let her know today god bless you you are dismissed